Let's turn our attention back to our lesson for this day. We continue to look at the life of Samson, and we come to this episode in chapter 15. When Samson came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey and put, it out, and put out his hand and took it, and with it he struck one thousand men. And Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey have I struck down a thousand men. As soon as he had finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone out of his hand. This is the word of the Lord. First again, let me uh, thank the class this year for their testimonies. You guys did a great job. Very proud of you. It takes courage to get up and share your faith, especially in front of adults and sometimes especially in front of your own family. Uh, So thank you for your courage. I want you to be thinking about that idea this morning. Use what you have. And I, I brought an illustration with me this morning. I'm 67 years old. Don't go ooh, okay? It's just, you know. But I'm 67 years old, and my mom and dad, when they were growing up, it was the Great Depression. And during the Great Depression, you learn to use what you have. People didn't have a lot of money, they didn't have a lot of anything, they had to make do. And so I brought with me today an example of that. Uh, Now, normally it'd come in a round pan, but I tried to make enough for everybody who's interested uh, to uh, try a little bit. You can kind of take a peek. Uh, What I made you today is called vinegar pie. (laughs) Oh, aren't your mouths watering now? You're going, oh, Danny, you didn't bring enough. I mean, wow, I could eat that half. Come on, you, you could, couldn't you? Yum, yum. (laughs) Don't lie, you're in the house of God. (laughs) No, it really is uh, vinegar pie. And uh, it's a very simple recipe. It's basically sugar and flour. Uh, Grandma always said, if you have it, put a little nutmeg in it. Uh, And then it's sugar, water, butter, tiny little bit of nutmeg, obviously a little bit of pie crust, uh, and then a whole lot of water and a whole lot of vinegar. Why do you put vinegar in it? Because otherwise it doesn't have any flavor at all. And uh, vinegar is not that hard to make, and you could make it on the farm. Uh, Ooh, ah, mm, ah, see? But when you don't have uh, food, you don't have an abundance of this or an abundance of that. Uh, you do what you have to do. You make do with what you have. You use what you have. And people who lived through the Depression, they learned how to do that. That might be dessert for Sunday's dinner. And my mom and dad growing up in the Depression would have said, wow, we have pie today. Mom made pie out of vinegar, but she made pie. God uses this guy. Now, of course, this is kind of a cartoon version of Samson. We have no idea if he had all those muscles, if he looked like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, or was he maybe, you know, four foot eleven and weighed all of about 90 pounds. We don't know, because it doesn't say his strength came from him. It came from God. But when you think of this guy, uh, you, you have to start asking yourself, this is the best that God could find? When he looks out over all of Israel, this, this, this is the cream of the crop, uh, this, this is the star, this is the hero, this is, this is the moral shining example that is going to lead his people back to faithfulness and back to reconciliation with the God of the covenant. Uh, we've been walking through this story with this guy. This guy's flawed, he's inadequate, he's broken, and he's sinful. 
Last week, you, you looked at the fact that he went to Timnah and he saw a woman. Now, he didn't know this woman, didn't know her name, didn't know anything about her, what she liked, what she didn't like, didn't have any of that. But he saw her and he said to his mom and dad, now get her for my wife. He saw her and he lusted after her. And he acted on that lust. And that relationship didn't go so well. Remember, she betrayed him. She gave away the clues to his riddle. And so he lost a bet with the Philistine people, and he was very angry, and he walked out of that marriage. And so this week's text says, well, after an expanse of time, he shows up, and now he wants to assume his husband's role in the life of his wife. Now, we don't know how much time has gone by in between his storming out and his return. Most Bible scholars, because we are told it's in the time of harvest, most Bible scholars say it's probably at least a year that he's been gone. So what kind of moral example is that? You come to see me, you've got some marital problems, you say, Pastor, you know, could we talk to you? You have some education, you have some experience, maybe you could help us. And I say, yes, I think you ought to separate for a year, not talk to each other, not see each other, not communicate in any way, uh, and I think that'll help your relationship. That's not good advice. But he's been gone, and all of a sudden he shows up only to find out that his father-in-law says, well, you know, you disappeared. We had no idea where you were. We had no idea what was going on. You stormed off in a huff. Uh, and so, you know, my daughter, she was lonely. She was brokenhearted. Uh, her whole life had collapsed, uh, and, I, and I gave her to another guy. This is not the moral example that God's people need. So he gets angry. And he gathers a bunch of foxes, 300. Now, how long does it take to catch 300 foxes? I, you know, I, I can't imagine, you know, you can just walk out your door in Israel and go, wow, 300 foxes, look at that. It doesn't happen that way. My, my point in that is to say he's furious, he's angry, he's enraged that his father-in-law has given what he considers his wife away. And so now he's going to set the high moral example, he's going to do the godly thing, He's going to get revenge. How long does it take to gather 300 foxes? I don't know. I'm going to guess at least a little while. A couple of days, a week, a month. I don't know. But see, he's got time to calm down. He's got time to think things through. He's got time to kind of regain perspective. I disappeared. I left her. I abandoned her. He's got time to pray about things. He's got time for the Spirit of God to help him gather a godly perspective. But despite the fact that he's got this time, he's just absolutely committed to revenge. And then, of course, once he burns down their fields, they're committed to revenge. And then he's committed to revenge. And we're going to see that that's the story of his life until he dies. You hurt me, so I hurt you. You hurt me, so I hurt you. You hurt me, so I hurt you. And nobody's willing to stop this violent foolishness. There are no efforts at reconciliation. There are no efforts at trying to find some more peaceful approach. It's just, you hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you worse. You came after me, so I'm going to kill a thousand of you. How is that a godly attitude? But it's not unfamiliar. Your spouse hurts you, so you hurt them, so they hurt you, so you hurt them. Your kids mouth off to you, so you punish them, so then they react to that, so then you react to that. It's just our broken, sinful, flawed human nature. He can't control his temper. Not that that's familiar to any of us. He can't and he won't control his lusts and his desires. If he sees it, 
He wants it, and if he wants it, he has to have it. No self-control, no self-denial. Perhaps, again, not so unfamiliar in certain areas of your life and mine. Really? This is the best we can do? This is who we raise up to be the deliverer, the rescuer, the savior of God's people? A flawed, inadequate, broken, and sinful man. But this is where we come to grips with the reality of the human condition. That's all there is. There isn't anybody that doesn't fit into that category. It doesn't matter whether you went to the seminary and you can wear a collar and robes and stand on this side of the church or you sit on that side of the church. We are all in that category. We routinely come into the house of God as we prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's table. And what do we do in front of everybody here? We admit that we have sinned against God in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Uh, and you know, do you, do you ever notice the people in front of you never turn around in shock that you've said that? <gasps> really, Danny? You, you? Nobody does that, do they? No, nobody sitting you know, next to you gives you that look like, <laughs> No, nobody's shocked at all because, hey, it's no surprise. You can't hide it from us. And it's no surprise that that's all of us. And so this is what God has to work with. This is his choice. As broken as it may be, as flawed as it may be, he is going to use you and he's going to use me. He's going to use what he has and we are what he has. And, and that's a consistent pattern. Just to quickly walk through some biblical examples. Remember Rahab, the prostitute in Jericho, when Joshua came in and they were going to destroy the city, they sent in some spies. Rahab saved the life of the spies. And they said, okay, in gratitude for your saving our life, when we come against this city, we won't hurt you and your family. And she's like, yeah, but you know, in the midst of a battle, in the midst of the war, in the midst of the violence, in the midst of the bloodshed, how are your troops going to know it's me? You know, they, there's no phone. Well, they'll just look at their phone and go, okay, yeah, that's her. Uh, don't hurt her. No. So they said, well, take a, a, a scarlet cord and hang it outside your house. And when we come to the house with the scarlet cord, uh, we will move on and we will not hurt the people in that house. Nothing incredible or mysterious or magical or supernatural. It's just a cord used by God to save everybody in that house. Balaam is a prophet and he's been hired by the enemies of God to go put a curse on God's people. Uh, I didn't know, you know, we could do that. I'd put a shingle out. I'll curse for fifteen ninety five. I mean, you know, I, I didn't know that's what God's people were supposed to do. But Balaam is on his way to curse God's people. And on his way, the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, is standing in the road. Now, Balaam can't see him, but the donkey can. And so the donkey stops. He's terrified by God standing in the road. And Balaam can't figure out why the donkey won't move, and he starts beating the donkey. And the donkey turns and says to him, hey, can't you see? You know, so how, how, what would you do if your dog started talking to you? Why are you so misbehaving? Because God is standing in the corner. You, you're not shocked that your dog can speak? But he seemingly can't get Balaam's attention. So he uses what he has in the moment, and that's a dumb animal who suddenly can speak. We know the story of David and Goliath. 
Goliath is down there taunting everybody. Come on, come on, come on, come out and fight me. Send your champion, send your hero. And if he wins, uh, then you win the war. And if I win, then we win the war. And he's taunting them and none of Israel's bravest will go. And here comes the shepherd boy and we know the story. As he goes down in the valley to fight the giant, the Bible says he picks up five stones. Now, it's interesting the Bible gives us that little detail, five stones. You know, it doesn't say he just picked up some stones or he picked up a stone. It's not like he missed the first four times and it's like, ooh, I got one left, you know. No, five. You know why he picked up five? Goliath has four brothers. I'll kill you, I'll kill your brothers. Because as soon as I kill you, they're going to come after me to get revenge. That's okay. I'm ready. I'll kill them too. God is going to give us the victory and nothing will stop us. Shepherd boy and five stones and they win the war. The story of Elijah. Remember, he is battling the king and his evil queen and he says it's not going to rain until I pray and ask God for it to rain. And it doesn't rain for three and a half years. Well, when it doesn't rain for three and a half years, all the crops die. Then the animals begin to die. And you run out of food. But to save the prophet's life, he told Elijah to go to Zarephath, and there you'll find a widow. And she's got a little boy. Now you go and live with that widow and that little boy. When he gets there, he says, hey, can I have something to drink? Can I have something to eat? Now it hasn't rained for three and a half years, so water is pretty precious. And so she says to the prophet, if you remember the story, well, you know, I, I, I'd like to help you, but I have just the tiniest little bit of flour and a tiny little bit of oil. Uh, I'm going to make a vinegar pie. It's all I got left, see. Uh, I'm going to make one last little cake. And I'm going to give it to my son. He'll eat it. And then we're going to die because we'll be out of food. We'll be out of water. Now, if all you had was one little morsel left and you've got children, do you give that morsel to a stranger you would never met? Do you bring the death of your children that much faster, that much quicker? Anybody? Volunteers? No. Nobody does that. But she does because the Spirit of God motivates her. And then God takes that little bit of oil and a little bit of flour. And for all the time that he is there, it never runs out. Every morning when she gets up... There's a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour. She makes a cake, uses it up. The next day when she gets up, there's a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour. She makes a cake. They eat it. It's gone. She gets up. A little Days, weeks, months. Use what you have. And God has a consistent pattern in the scripture of using what he has. Now, the key, of course, is to remember what happened In this chapter in Judges, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. When he picked up that jawbone, this was not Arnold Schwarzenegger in a Hollywood movie where he can kill 300 people and all of them shoot at him and none of them can seem to hit him. This is real life. These are trained Philistine warriors. They rush upon one man And all he has is the jawbone of a donkey. And he slays them, and he slays them, and he slays them, and he slays them until there are a thousand warriors lying dead at his feet. How did he do that? The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Every time he does something incredible, it's because God has done it through him. Four young, courageous people came up here and shared their faith with us this morning. Now, I know you're all wonderful. But at the same time, you are just who you are. But when the Spirit of God comes upon you, who knows what you can do? When God calls you and God ordains you and God deploys you, who knows what you can do in his name and for his kingdom? Because it is God who is at work, not you, not me. 
Jesus promised us you will receive power when the Holy Spirit is come upon you. Not necessarily the power to tear down temples or to defeat armies with a single jawbone. Uh, your gift, your power may be something else, but the power that you need, the ability that you need to do what God has called you will be there when you need it. People often say to me, you know, Danny, you move around and you do all these things, you know, were you, were you ever in acting? And the answer is yes, absolutely, I was. I always wanted to be a pastor. This is all I ever wanted to do once I realized I was never going to replace Ernie Banks and be the shortstop of the Cubs. Once that dream went away, I said, no, okay, God, I get it. I'm not going to be on the Cubs. I'm going to be a pastor. The only problem was I was terrified to get up in front of people and talk. That was overwhelming to me. How do you become a pastor and you can't get up in front of people and talk? So I forced myself into drama. I forced myself to take a role in this play and that play and to do this and to do that, to get up on stage and to be in front of people and to get comfortable. None of which, none of which helps me with this job at all. Because the only thing that helps me is God. If God wants me up here, God will empower me when I'm up here. If God wants you out there, God will empower you when you are out there. And I know we all say to ourselves, oh, who am I to do this? Who, who am I to step up in this moment? Who am I to say something? Who am I to share? Who am I to call a group to prayer? Who am I to extend a word of kindness? Who am I to create an act of generosity. You are the instrument of God. And the Spirit of God has come upon you in the waters of baptism. The same Spirit that empowered this man to do miracles has come to you and empowers you to do His will. It is God who works in you. I don't have the education, I don't have the training, I don't have the experience, I, I'm not sure I would know what to do. That's okay, God knows what to do. It is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. How is God going to save Aurora? How is He going to expand His kingdom? How is he going to bring more people to faith and to discipleship? Well, there's his answer. You. Because he has called you and he will use you. Now, I, I, I literally do have some bowls and some spoons for the brave folks who are willing to try vinegar pie. But you don't have to, even though, you know, we are taping and I'll go home and look and see who didn't try, but that's okay. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not a vengeful kind of guy. You know? No, seriously, you don't have to. But you know, I had a choice. I had a choice. I, I decided to go with vinegar uh, pie. Lynn and I debated it for a while. Uh, there's another depression uh, pie I could bring, and you know, if you beg me enough, I maybe could bring it sometime, but uh, it's called water pie. Ooh. Literally called water pie. You're thinking, what, we pour a thing of water in a, you know, pie crust? Uh, what's up with that? It's water, and it's water, and it's water. A little bit of flour, a little bit of sugar, a little bit of butter. Uh, did I mention water? Uh, that's it. Now, when we came out of the Depression in the war, people began to take water pie and give it a little flavor as uh, things became a little more prosperous uh, because of the, the war effort and, and so on and so forth, and people had jobs and whatever. They began to put vanilla 
or maybe a little cinnamon or something in the water pie. But in, you know, 1930, 1931, 1932, uh, it was water, flour, butter, sugar. Bake it, eat it. So when you sit down today and have your, uh, you know, raspberry, white chocolate, macadamia nut ice cream sundae, or you have your mint, you know, uh, chocolate brownies, or you stop at McDonald's and get a shamrock shake, think of what it was to be five, six, seven years old and have your mouth start watering because mom put on the table a water pie, a vinegar pie. And dad said, before we eat this wonderful pie, let's bow our heads and let's pray. And let's thank God for the wonderful bounty he has put before us. Let's thank God we have pie today. They used what they had as best they could. For centuries, God has been using what he has, and he has exploded his kingdom and changed human history. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks and praise that in the waters of holy baptism, the spirit of the living God fell upon us. He brought us the grace and the redemption of our Lord Jesus Christ, washed away our sin, made us new, and we became the children of God himself. But we also became his instrument and his vessel. We became a part of the plan and the mission. And we pray, Lord, as long as we have breath, that you would use us to your glory. We pray that however and wherever the opportunity arises. We would put our faith and our trust in you, not ourselves, not our abilities, not our experience, not our education, but in you. And trust that if you have called us to this moment, you will use us in this moment to your glory and for the expansion of your kingdom. We thank you for the courage of Addison and Bailey and Jonathan and Eli this morning. We pray that the faith which they have shared would continue to grow and deepen to mature as they walk with you and you walk with them. Keep them in the one true church. That as they feast upon your word, upon the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, they would continue to grow, to deepen their experience, their faith, and their trust in you. And as we gather next week and celebrate the rite of confirmation, as they stand before you and all of your church and they make their vows and their promises, anoint them anew and afresh, encourage and strengthen them, watch over them, bless them, and keep them safe. We pray, Lord, for all our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in need of your healing grace, to be rescued from this time of trial. We pray for their families as obviously they are worried and concerned and pray for their peace to be found only in your presence. And so we pray for Dave Bauman, Mark Heimsoth, Charlene Bauman, for my dad Norman, for Pastor Fritz, for Solomon Dale, for Diane Bowen, for Rich Gosling, Bill Hoppy. We pray for Rich Sheldon. We pray for J.P. Jones, for Paul Ryan, for Michael Otis. We pray, Lord, for all those that are known to us in our hearts and ask in the precious name of Jesus for your healing grace. Heavenly Father, as we continue to seek to know your will in regards to the future of New Song, as we seek a pastor, a shepherd, to serve under you, to lead, to guide, to care, to comfort, to correct, and to rebuke us. 
guide and direct us through this process until we find that right person. And they accept your divine call and join our family of faith here. And together we build your kingdom in this place. We pray, Lord, for all those that are struggling in the midst of natural disasters, the people who are struggling uh, under all the snow that has fallen across the country, the people of Turkey and Syria, for those who are struggling with all the train wrecks that uh, have been happening lately, especially the people of Ohio, for the people who are victims of violence, we pray, Lord, for your rescue, your deliverance, for your comfort, for your encouragement. You've told us to pray for those who serve in authority over us, so we pray for our president, our vice president, all our senators, our congressmen and women. We pray for all the governors, the state legislatures, for mayors and city councils. Give them wisdom and discernment to know what is right, what is true, what is best, and help them to persevere in its pursuit. For your instruments of safety and protection, we pray for those who serve in our armed forces, for our firefighters, our police officers, our first responders and civil servants. However, wherever they serve, Lord, watch over them, bless them, and keep them all safe. Help them to fulfill all their duties and their responsibilities and when it is the appropriate moment to come home and be reunited with their loved ones. These and all things, Lord, we bring before you in the words that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.